Welcome back uh, to another episode of Adam's Everything EV. I have Christian. You had something you wanted to say right away. Let's just get into a Q&A. Go ahead. Oh, I was, I was going to tell you um, that we have seen a pretty um, impressive uptick in, in people buying these vehicles in the past few weeks. We engage that on our end because um, when we have members who sell their vehicles, when a new person buys it, um, they get a message, they get an automatic message from our system that says they have uh, a vehicle that was registered by someone else previously. And then um, we get a new email from from them to re-register. And, and in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a pretty significant uptick in, in people picking these vehicles up. That's and, wonderful. And, and, Interestingly, also, I mean, when they when they get in touch and they say they picked them up, they part of the reason they say they picked them up is because they know about FOA and what we're doing and they think it's interesting and they want to be a part of it. Well, yeah, I mean, you guys obviously now have well are in the process of and we'll get into that rolling into a controlled like ownership type of role as an organization. And that's it's just great. I mean, and honestly, let's say three, four months ago, like midsummer. It was just bad news. I mean, it was nothing but bad news. And so yep. this is, you know, we're starting to move out of that. And you guys knew that was coming. Like the, 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 you know, it had to get worse before it got better. And here we are. Um, I got a whole bunch of questions. I, I, if you want to just do a rapid fire, I know the audience would, would love to hear your insights and uh, congratulations on the new COO title. So I know they, they bumped your pay from zero all the way up to zero. So congrats, <laughs> congratulations on that. Uh, I know you guys are working real hard though. And I really do. I, I'm, I'm glad that you have a position uh, and you guys have been able to set up a hierarchy so you can get things done more easily. I, that's real important. I think we get to basically control the future of what happens with these vehicles, not just like the people who are like volunteering for FOA. It's the entire ownership, you know, the, the way we want to set things up. We want to make sure that people have a, a voice and the ability to have a say in what is happening in their vehicles, the experience of those vehicles, um, and the experience of being a part of this organization. You know, obviously, we all got kind of shafted um, big time by by Fisker and um, also by the bankruptcy process and so forth and so on. You know, it is our mandate, <clears throat> certainly my mandate, um, you know, that comes down, down for me and everybody else who has been in leadership that, you know, we need to do our best for owners and this is owner driven and we must listen to owners and, and like do what we can for owners because we ourselves are also owners. Best case scenario, what we do is we can have some significant impact on the direction of what it means to own an EV or own a vehicle in this sort of like overly SaaS driven kind of environment for vehicle ownership. Um, production, the, the actual Fisker Ocean unit uh, will production ever resume for these cars, or do you know? By our hand or American Lisa's hand, I want to say the answer is probably no. Um, you know, the production is incredibly complicated, and you know, there's, there's, that's more—it's even more complicated than you know we have the ability to get into. And I'm not sure that Josh even wants to get into that either. So, we won't be involved in that. You know, obviously the IP is out there, and someone may buy that and choose to restart the production line, but we have no visibility into that. So yes and yes, like the IP is for sale and someone will eventually own it. Is that true? In theory, yes. Okay. Um, obviously, um, IP is is a big question. And as far as the IP, can we talk about just like a surface level? Um, what, what access do you have and what access does American Lease have? And can you maybe compare and contrast how that works out? So what we have is a license and we have um, essentially the same exact license that American Lease has. Um, and so what that means is we have access to source code and everything so that we can use it for our purposes. There are going to be some um, some guardrails on that, things we can and can't change and in, you know other stuff we can. Um, the thing we absolutely cannot do, either us or American Lease, is we can't resell it. We can't uh, monetize it in any way. Um, that... IP as it stands right now, um, I believe belongs still to belongs to Heights, um, and it's theirs to sell. Um, but if they do sell it, you know they they you know we we our license continues in the way in the way that it did. Okay, and then that that monthly or actually I believe it's a quarterly fee you guys are eventually going to roll out um, is that's probably trying to roll together everything, the access to the cloud, the software as a service, the the T-Mobile, the whatever you guys decide to do as a like a navigation type of thing. So uh, I just wanted to point that out, that all of that stuff is rolled together. And the reason you have a license is because of this 
I guess, let's see, hurdle when it regarding the access from the cars, right? Can you talk about that just briefly? I know we've covered it before on the channel. So, yeah, there was a uh, sort of a uh, 11th hour um, pickup uh, that American Lease discovered in the way the cars operate that basically they, they can't they can't take them off of the Fisker cloud uh, because there's something hard coded as a car that makes that impossible. So that led them to uh, to their uh, emergency objection, which ultimately led also to the negotiations around our having access as well as as a part of that. Just to clarify, American Lease already had this license, right? Yeah. And then you guys came in and said, OK, well, we need to also have ownership. American Lease was able to partner with you guys to get that license and then that $2.5 million is kind of the FOA's responsibility to pay, right? But with American Lease's cooperation, am I getting that right? That is true. I mean, there. so the, the, we have to like sort of be separating these into two issues because there was there was actually a an issue of uh, the the sort of where the, where the cloud is pointed and the complication of sort of like changing that to a migrated environment was a problem. Um, sort of then the second issue is, you know, our access as well. And it just made sense to put those two things together. And you are correct that the, the 2.5 million over uh, five years is our responsibility. Um, and that's $500,000 a year. That is the license fee. Um, and if some people have thought that that was the cloud fee, that that's, a, that's actually not true. That is the, the pound of flesh that um, has been exacted for us to have access to that license. Okay. And once again, that was free with the $40 million, obviously, from American Lease. And that was in that original fleet sale agreement that you guys, you guys have now worked out to where that same license has been appropriated to you guys. But indeed, it is a license to clarify, right? It is a license. They do not. They're not. Uh, I think that they're trying to sell the actual IP for quite a bit more than that. It's like something like a roadmap <laughs> to a, a, an EV. But um, yeah, and it will. And obviously, that's completely up in the air. Um, will American Lease be able to service these oceans with Uber drivers in New York City? There's going to be a lot of accidents. So um, you know. So how does that? How is that working? One of the great things about the partnership we have with American Lease, and by the way, they, they've been uh, an excellent partner throughout this process. And um, Josh and I uh, joke that we, um, he joked the other day that like he talks to me more than he talks to his wife, um, which is possibly true. I mean, he and I are on the phone more than once a day now. Um, but one of the interesting things is that um, we'll be able to integrate our engineering team in with the engineering team that's working on the cloud, and we'll all collaborate on on this together. Together, which which I'm excited about. Um, so that's from from the from the software end of things. Um, in terms of servicing, uh, American Lease has said uh, they will open their their garage up um, exclusively to um, Fisker owners. Um, their garage is obviously not a not a commercial not a uh, a retail garage. Um, they mostly just service their vehicles, but um, they've made an exception for um, our owners. Um, and then uh, I think one other thing that I think is really important to get across is like a big part of our um, original agreement with them was um, they want to do um, major collision bodywork. Um, and so, you know, where, where it's feasible, I think more or less on the east eastern half of the United States, um, you know, we, we would look to them as our preferred um, major collision repair body shop. Right. And so I know those like service and parts and collision repair and then sourcing all that stuff and getting it rolled out is obviously a bottleneck but the further that opens the the, the better you're going to be and obviously american lease is new york city only people aren't going to be you know i can't say oh they're going to open an american lease in los angeles but if they're in that local area and they're able to get to them it's just another option for you guys is am i getting yep. that right Okay. Yeah, and we're also we're also, by the way, um, you know, um, there are still a lot of people who um, live in service deserts, and uh, we're working. Um, you know, I, I, we're inter we're international, so I mean, I think I want to speak both in this case for um, North America and Europe. Um, North America is a little further along because of some of the um, annoying particularities of the way that Fisker approached uh, the bankruptcy. Um, but I mean, one of our um, primary objectives right now is to get additional service um, service uh, options opened. Um, and, you know, we're, we're diligently sort of like um, entertaining um, inquiries by shops that want to service oceans. And then we're also in, in a regular communication with uh, a lot of ex Fisker mobile techs who want to get back to work. This license that you guys have, is this giving you an opportunity? There's two tools, by the way, the fast tool, 
and the OFT tool. And th does this license, like how does that give you any freedoms within the basically, I guess, ordering application licensing for these tools? Can you dive down that, I mean, to the best of your ability? Sure. So as of now, um, we are free and clear to order new fast and OFT tools. We've had a lot of owners sort of say, why can't I get myself a fast tool or, or whatever? And um, the, there's a misconception that um, the fast tool was something that was owned by Fisker and now that Fisker is gone, um, it, it's just something that could be free and people could just have it. Other than the fact that uh, Fisker's IP, again, is still owned by um, someone else. So we, we don't have the right to just sort of use it freely and give it away to whoever we want. Um, the fast tool and the OFT tool were actually built by a third party. Um, and that third party is the one who issues, um, the tools and the licenses for those, those, uh, for those tools. Um, and you know, they, they have, uh, restrictions on what they will give away, right? I mean, they, but they, uh, they require people who they give these licenses to, to be trained as, as EV techs, to have certain certifications, to have uh, commercial licenses, to work on vehicles. And, um, you know, on top of that, there is a cost to the tool and there will be a, a yearly license fee for those things. And so, you know, I think that for the, um, the person who wants to work in these cars at home, there's, there are some barriers that make it, um, kind of a hard sell to be able to give them to them. So as much as I would love to be able to just give out fast tools, I don't think it's a good idea. Well, it's not, a, not just not a good idea. It's hard to do. And then it's also not a good idea because um, the fast tool is a little finicky and um, you can easily brick your car. There's also um, enterprising engineer types um, in our ownership. And so, you know, there are going to be tools coming down the pipe very soon that will allow people to just use their OBD port to do some things in their cars. Also, let's talk about Europe, Fisker Austria. Can you explain like what kind of entity that is? And is that Fisker Inc.? And will and and then finally to roll it all in, will Fisker Inc. continue or has that? Because I get this question all the time. You know, where's my stock? You know, Fisker's coming back when they sell the IP. Can you? Is that something you're qualified to talk about, or does that just not make any sense? I would say your stock is toast. I'm say I'm sorry to say, but that is the reality. Um, Fisker um, America is no more. Uh, they went Chapter Seven a few weeks ago. Um, so Fisker uh, Fisker North America is gone. Um, Fisker Austria, there is a reconstituted Fisker Austria, um, but I think there's some confusion about what that means. Fisker Austria right now is trying to figure out like what, what to do in terms of they, the where there's a warehouse in Graz or three warehouses, I believe in Graz with like tons and tons of uh, parts. And so the first thing that I'm, I'm aware of this grocery is going to do is they're going to stand up a, uh, a mechanism for making those parts available to both us and American lease. Um, beyond that, I didn't know that they've thought beyond that at this point. Um, certainly not to the point of like restarting the line though. I know that. No, now is and Fisker Austria, is that like a private company owned by like Magna and Heights or how does that work? That's where you're getting into the area that I'm not quite sure about. I believe that Fisker Austria is basically the um, the front for a trust that was um, that's under the control of Magna and Heights. Okay, all right. So I, I, I will caveat that by saying I'm I'm not entirely sure about that though. Well, me neither. I got that's that's just the the extent of what I've been able to piece together is that Magna has a, a hand in it, Heights has a hand in it. I don't know how that all works. But yeah. uh, thank you for confirming like the North American Fisker, like FSRNQ or whatever. That's yeah. not though that entity will be dissolved after it goes from 11 to seven and all that. Right. Well, it went from 11 to seven um, on the I believe the 18th or something. Um, OK, so that's what that's already happened. There is a like caretaker cloud operation that still exists as a kind of a zombie thing. Um, and that will be in place as, as of now until uh, December 31st, at which point um, the control of that cloud is handed over to American Lease and the FOA. Okay. Um, let's go back to just, and let, let's get Europe and that, that side of the, the world out of the way really quick too. Are there unsold cars and are those American Lease cars? That's a good question. Um, I don't know um, if and how many are American lease cars? There are definitely unsold cars. I'm aware that there are some dealerships over there that have um, cars that they're trying to sell. So they exist. Uh, I don't know in what number though. Okay. And that's probably why, because there's a difference in value too. Like these European cars, we haven't seen the values go down quite as much, I don't think, as the American cars. 
but I have seen that some are selling to independent people. Once again, just trying to clarify, it's all murky. Um, it, is, it is. It is very. I mean, look. Um, yeah. I mean, I've been swimming in it for the last five months now. So yeah, murky is the the operative word. Uh, UK right hand drive is that. I think there's a concern there about right hand drive specifically. I think the UK was the only right hand drive country, if I'm not wrong. It is. Um, what happens with like specific right hand drive parts? Is that probably going to be one of the adventures you'll have to take later? Josh and I've talked about this um, and, you know, we want to figure out like how we can make sure that parts are supplied for those cars as well. So I think that's a TBD at this point, but um, it is uh, it is a top line item because we want to make sure that we're also um, paying attention to them. Now, obviously, this is not a perfection type of situation. There's been a lot of good news recently compared to especially the bad news from June, July, August. Um, unbricking cars in Europe, is that possible? And is that being done? And what's being pursued to do that? I know that the, the bricks are everywhere, but I know there are tools in the US and they're trying to, you guys are trying to allocate that. But um, what about Europe? Is that a, is that a thing? So my um, kind of a parallel COO in Europe, who is a, a guy named Jens Gute, uh, he's uh, one of our Norwegians. Um, it refers to a program that they're working on with Graz called the Flying Doctors. And they have a team of um, Fisker engineers that kind of go from place to place to deal with unbreaking in Europe while they're waiting to spin up um, service points. Um, in North America, okay. it's a little bit easier uh, because now people can take them places. And we have we already have a number of uh, mobile techs and stuff who can come to you. And, and we've had a lot of success uh, on bricking cars through that. So, um, you know, it's getting easier over time. And we've been also doing, again, I can't speak to, to Europe yet because they're still getting their uh, service op operation in order. But um, in North America, what we've been doing is we have been connecting all of the techs and service centers so that they can um, collaborate on stuff, share information, and kind of build a, a better knowledge base for how to unbreak things faster. Um, a lot of these shops were new to Fisker when, when they got the fast tools and they weren't terribly well trained by Fisker because Fisker was just basically like trying to kind of get out of the burning building. And um, and well, we have a lot of like incredible um ex Fisker techs and uh, master techs who who know these vehicles better than anybody and who have been incredibly generous with their time to help these new shops understand like all the the, the quirky nuances of these cars. And as you know, there are quite a few, right? And let's also be clear, there are a lot of rumors about upgraded software, you know, past 2.2. Um, the number I was able to get a hold of is about 25% of vehicles got updated with this 2.2 final Fisker rollout software, and That's right now they're not doing any more. Is that right? Not doing any more is basically just the trustee putting a pause on everything because, um, you know, they're doing whatever they're doing. And so um, that pause will lift, you know, pursuant to like some things that I think Josh is talking to them about, and we're, we're trying to work out the details here. So, you know, the it's not really a will it ever begin again it is when will it begin again um and so not quite sure you know but we would like obviously for that to start again right away but um we'll see i mean i think that the likely restart is whenever we get control of the cloud um you know and there is a possibility that might happen sooner than december 31st but you know um there's a lot of things right now in this weird trough between the chapter seven and that January 1st date, which are a little uncertain. And, you know, I think part of it is just the the trustees trying to get its legs and trying to figure out like what's going on with this. And, you know, um, honest story. I mean, you know, they've been handed a dish show. So that's going to take some, going to take some weeding through to like figure things out. And so, you know, I think we're just trying, just trying to like navigate this and figure out like, you know, what makes sense from their perspective. So on top of software, the other concern obviously is parts. Um, can you go into like parts manufacturing? Then th let's do it from a like a what's the future going to look like perspective. I know right now it's all just convoluted and you're making contacts and some things are this and that. But can you tell me like from a, an ideal or like a goal based perspective, like what what's the what's the outcome here with parts? Um, where we're at right now is you know there there are shops that have. Uh, have vehicles. There are, there are salvage places that have vehicles. There are um, a number of cars being parted out all over the place. Um, there's also there was also a an inventory at La Palma um, that we're sorting through. That's in an American Lease warehouse now in New Jersey. Sorry, not New Jersey, uh, Long Island. 
Um, and you know, all of this stuff will eventually, um, what we're trying to do is we're having, we're trying to like pipe all that through the tsunami website so that there is a one-stop shop where people can find all of the things from various places and they don't have to go like calling 20 places to get it. Right. Um, you know, and so, so there would be like a pass through, through that website. And then any, anybody who needs parts would go there and they would, they would find them there. Um, okay. There is a, this, there's the, the, the part stockpile in Graz, which um, they're sort of working through the details on now at some point, uh, I believe in the next couple months, that's going to come online as well. So um, there's a number of parts from there, um, you know, and then um, as you mentioned, and um, as you know, we've, we've mentioned, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a, a manufacturing um, operation as well for uh, high failure parts um, that American lease is spinning up. So, you know, um, a few months after that, that'll come online. You know, we're also in talks now with uh, glass makers to do windshields and things like that. And so, you know, um, I also anticipate, you know, the next six months or something that'll also come online. So, you know, the, the immediate term is dicey and it's hard to find things. Um, the trajectory is much more stable. And, you know, we at American Lease have um, really done a lot of work in the last, you know, three months or so to make sure that um, in that supply chain, we don't wind up with price gougers and, and people who are just trying to make money off of our owners. And um, and also, I mean, Josh doesn't want that for his operation either because it's expensive for him. You know, and so we've done a pretty good job of tamping down on that stuff and trying to make sure that there is a reasonably priced pipeline of parts that will eventually be available through that tsunami storefront so that when um, owners and um, shops need stuff or insurance co uh, companies need stuff, they just go there and that's one place. Okay, so Tsunami Automotive, and I'll put a link right here, is like a one-stop shop for Fisker. Basically, you want to see how much progress you guys have made in you know being able to get stuff done. That's a good, probably, place to check. Um, I got a couple questions when it comes to Tsunami. First of all, I bought a charger from you. Um, you've got a very reasonably priced level one charger. Um, yeah, I right. did order it just to support you guys. If you need a level one charger, it's probably like the cheapest one you can get in the United States right now. But Tsunami is a entity that you guys created to organize this distribution of parts to owners. Am, am I getting that right? The, the nonprofit rules uh, are pretty strict about certain things. And um, we want to kind of keep a clear um you know delineation between, you know, what is what is what is membership stuff and what is what is uh a membership association and what is a parts operation a membership association is not a parts operation right and so it makes more sense from from a tax perspective and uh from a like just staying on the right side of the law perspective and also from a like sort of clarity of funds perspective to kind of have those be two different things um and there's also uh you know insurance padding to like having a parts operation be a part of a the, the nonprofit is not a uh, not a very smart thing to do so if you're looking for a fisker ocean parts tsunami automotive definitely the way to check and also if you go to tsunami, the tsunami website right now there are not parts available um that's going to be something that rolls out over the next few months um, of course yeah. So I want to make sure that's clear because um, people will go there and be like, where are all the parts? That is a little, a little bit of a bridge to um, Fisker Owner Association membership. This is a lot of contingency on people joining and being a part of this. And I do want to lead, I've mentioned it previously, that uh, a premium OnStar membership is like $50 a month for mm -hmm. just for your GM product to have, you know, low jack and uh, connectivity and Wi-Fi hotspot and whatnot. And you guys are very close, basically in the same realm as that $50 a month is where you're looking to be at. Obviously, once again, it's all murky and it's being worked on. But um, what happens if I don't decide to join, though? Like, let's say I have a, uh, uh, let's say an accident or a windshield problem or a part I need, um, or I'm de I've decided not to connect my car to the cloud. Can you talk about some of the, like, because this is kind of the, the point of contention here, what happens if I decide not to join? Once again, I don't want people to not join. I think being a part of this community has a ton of benefits, and I'd love for you to talk about those and then what the opposite side of the coin might look like. And so the answer I'm going to give right now is probably going to be a little unsatisfying. The answer is we're not sure yet. Um, and I have uh, set everybody to have a mandate um, for the next 
in the, within the next month, we want to be clear about like, what does membership get you? And if you're not a member, what happens, right? Um, and so I, I, I don't want to speak in specifics around that right now because um, we're not quite sure what that should be yet. And, you know, we don't want to put anybody in, into a situation where, you know, not paying, you know, puts them in a, in, 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 uh, at a risk of, of any sort. And so, you know, we have to be careful about how we approach that and thoughtful about how we approach that. And I want to make sure that we have the time to do that. Do you plan on connecting cars for people who don't pay? To the cloud that's one of the things we need to figure out okay so just and just to be completely clear this has just happened like october is the month that the fisker chapter 7 started all of this so this is all brand new and for the best way to be updated i know because i am not a fisker owners association member i get all my information third party second hand that's why i come directly to you to clarify um if you want to know what's going on join the foa it's the you'll know immediately you'll know much more quickly um but i appreciate you telling me at least where you're at with that because i know that's a really really big point of contention i have conversations with people like every day who like are like on the fence about this or like concerned about like what it means and i get to like take their input and you know and, and think about like well like how do i answer that what, what how do i how do we make this worthwhile to people and i don't think it's just you know just just like you you get to pay for the cloud and you get to pay for fisker's ip and you get to pay for these things that shouldn't you shouldn't have to pay for at all right i think that for me it's it's actually um to think about this in a different way it's uh, is that you know you mentioned onstar before i don't really have a whole lot of control over what i get from onstar i just pay them what i pay them and then they give me something right the difference in this case is we want people to have as much input as possible into the experience of their vehicles, and so that so that we can make this experience ours, the experience of the organ, the association itself, but also the experience of things like infotainment and stuff that most car companies would never give you the ability to say, "Here's what I want in this," and you know, and we'll make it for them, you know, based on you know, obviously what. Um, kind of rises to the top for you know the majority of people but you know in this case we do have that opportunity and so there's that sort of the ability to control your destiny in a way that you don't i think in most car ownership situations and also you know you talked you mentioned um updates and and you know future um os stuff i mean look it's these things are possible the barriers in a lot of cases are money right it's homologation it is like distribution channels it's things like that and the time that it takes to finish that development because a lot of it was started i mean you know it's just these uh, kind of loose threads they're not done yet right um you know and so i think that there is the space here to have those debates amongst members you know do we like actually get audacious and try to do these things and you know we can have those conversations and i think that you know the the ability to kind of be a part of that ownership experience is different than sort of just being told, Hey, you just got to pay this for, you know, like for your car, you know? And so my goal, you know, in, in my, in my role is really to kind of um, impart that feeling into all the people who are working on this and sort of like, how, how can we make this worth the while for the people who have to pay it? <clears throat> I think part of it is like learning from them about what they want. And, you know, based on what you want, what can we do here with this money? We are, we're going to have to pay for this stuff. Obviously the number one thing that, especially North America, because of the Apple adoption here, everybody wants CarPlay. Um, mm -hmm. That's not simple, right? Am I right about that? CarPlay actually is high on our list of things. It's also high on American leases list. So, um, you know, this, this, this stuff is in play in a way that it wasn't with Fisker. Because uh, Fisker was never going to do that, right? They're... I mean, Fisker apparently was really never going to do anything for anybody. <laughs> I, I think you nailed it. Yeah. So, um, and then just because this is right in the same vein. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got that clip from you. Are you going to try for CarPlay? It's something you're working on. I know a lot of people are going to be excited about that. And if you yeah. want that, that'll be an FOA benefit. Um, let's talk about TomTom. Tom. What was, how did that decision-making process go to just decide to, hey, for now, we're not going to worry about them. Feedback I hear, um, you know, from North America and Europe is is that TomTom Tom wasn't very good. And, you know, if we have the, the ability to do something better that we control, 
why not do that instead? You know, um, instead of paying TomTom, Tom, you know, this ransom to to keep using their system, like why don't we just like take this as an opportunity to to develop something better? I know that um, American Lease also is feeling the same way about it, and so we put our heads together and work on that and do something better. And also, again, you know, it's something that is going to be informed by owners for owners. And when we put these, when we put it into cards, it's going to be the things that they asked for. Right, and T-Mobile's part of that, and there's pretty pretty much no problem with that right t-mobile will move forward through the foa t-mobile yeah t-mobile uh service will continue um and we're working on negotiations with them to, to keep that in perpetuity so um i don't think people need to worry about that and i had a sport model it was literally bare bones but fisker was so i guess uh inept that they weren't even able to limit my capability so i got hollywood mode and you know everything that wasn't physically installed i had access to uh whatever people have access to now there's some concern about will they lose it later i know fisker sent me an email back in december like oh we're going to take away your hollywood mode on this date which i knew they weren't even going to be a company at that point um but you guys don't intend on nerfing anything at this point right no okay so if you have an ultra you you're still going to have hollywood mode um that that was a question um let me. Th I think really. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? I really want to. I want you. I, I want to encourage you guys to bookmark Tsunami Automotive. Uh, check them out. Like once again, here's another link. Um, check out Tsunami Automotive. They will eventually be offering parts if you need a charger. Get that level one uh, for Fisker Owners Association members. What are you offering as far as the key fob? So um, key fobs. We're in the middle of a, a large key fob buy right now. Um, I think which will be over three thousand pieces um and that's moving forward I, I believe that that goes into production this week um those will be available i, I think those, those should arrive for people in uh four to six weeks i believe uh from about now um and then in terms of getting those programmed i know people have a lot of questions about that um service points uh the service providers uh can all program via fast um all of the mobile techs who are crisscrossing the country they also can program those um we're also looking at um, we're we're buying a number of um, the uh, Chevrolet tools um, ourselves as uh, either either through Tsunami or through FOA. I'm not sure which, um, but um, we want to make those available to people who live in service deserts to do um, programming meetups. Um, so you know we're we're working on this. Europe also has its own. Um, mechanisms for this i think their their mechanism right now is mostly meetups um and they've also they're also going to have a number of chevalier tools over there to do those um so there there will be options to program we're not too worried about that great um that will what we're also picking up a stockpile of pkc modules which will be available through um through tsunami in case people run into problems with those um yeah so that's that's sort of that's a great rundown first, that's the first, I mean, also, you know, it's, it's the first, um, kind of, uh, demonstration of the, the power numbers, right? Because, uh, we, we remember, remember, um, you know, over the summer, um, there was a dealership I will not name that was selling key fobs for 1200 bucks a piece, you know, and, um, the going rate, you know, right now often is still about 400, but when we negotiated with Chevalier, we got that down to 289 um, for both the card, like two cards and and the fob, you know, and and um, so and we did that because we did this as a, as a large group. Um, and that's also, you know, part, part of the benefit of being like a part of the association rather than kind of working on your own is that that's not possible on your own. I mean, if you had gone to Chevalier on your own to buy a key fob, they would have charged you 450 bucks for it. Yeah. And then you're stuck with the programming thing too, which you guys are organizing and trying to make as easy as possible. I know as well. So, um, yep. you know, like I said, this is really, if you own a Fisker ocean and you're watching this video, please consider joining the FOA. You're going to have input you're going to have the benefit of knowing knowing things as they happen and obviously the connectivity and future projects are going to be at your disposal as well uh christian this was impromptu it was literally you, you i i just created a zoom meeting and you jumped in and i know you're 
I, I, I'm, I'm probably married to this project at this point, like you alluded to earlier, but thank you so much for, for jumping in and giving me an opportunity to pick your brain. It's, it's a pleasure. And once again, congratulations on the COO position. I, I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you have the ability to, to move some things around. That's really great. I'm autistic and obsessive. And so um, I've become very, I'm, I like a number of other people who um, in different capacities have become um, somewhat obsessed with this vehicle. And I think part of it is because uh, there's just, we see beyond Fisker and um, an opportunity from like the ashes of a car company that doesn't exist anymore to actually like create something totally new. And there's one other thing I wanted to mention too that's associated with this that I think is important um, because, you know, the Fisker situation, the way that what happened to the company, it's going to happen to other companies, um, other car companies. And um, one of the things that is a real problem with that is data rights. Um, you know, when a car company goes bankrupt, what happens to your data? Do you own that data? What happens to all your SaaS services? Uh, you know, there, there's a distinct lack of regulation around these things that um, kind of makes it what it became, you know, that this like battle in court to just have access and ownership over the things that like kind of belong to us. And so part of, one of the things that we want to do as an, as an association too is to advocate for um, the rights of vehicle owners, especially EV owners um, around um, data rights. And also all these ridiculous things like, you know, you have to pay a, a, like, uh, like a, a fee to like roll your windows down, things like that. I mean, the, the lack of regulation around those things is going to mean that like increasingly um, the things you can do in your car are going to become more and more restricted. So you buy this shell of something, but then you never own it. You basically just pay somebody forever to use it. And, um, you know, one of the things I personally believe is, I mean, I don't think that's right. And I don't think there's enough regulation around it. I think that there are places where that makes sense, but it's sort of being applied to everything. I mean, BMW makes you pay money to heat your seats, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. I don't, well, and, and Tesla old. batteries have been software limited. You yeah. Know, that, I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, so, you know, how, how can we use this situation as an opportunity to do something that is not just beneficial to us, but just more generally? Well, what happens, final question, and once again, you, you're, you've you been just so generous with your insights today. Um, what happens after the five years, the $2.5 million that IP license? Are you going to have to go to the future owner of the Fisker IP and and ask them for more access? What happens then? The technology moves so fast that in five years, uh, you know, the renegotiation in five years would likely be for less than what we're doing now, just because the technology will be five years old at that point. And in five, I mean, we move so quickly that in five years, you know, we, we will have moved on to stuff that's totally different. So I think the thinking on that was, um, you know, don't lock yourself into a 10 year um, or forever um license fee when you know in 10 years you know the technology is not going to be worth as much so five years is an opportunity not a drawback is what you're saying yeah no that's that's the way i see it yeah okay uh, I, that's a that's a great perspective because i know there's some you know some pessimism around that and i'm really glad that you're looking at it that way and that you give you know gives owners a chance to say hey we we, we can start building now and then the more we figure out then we'll be able to ask for, you know, less inter intervention, let's say, in the future. Yeah. I mean, and also, like, you know, the, the numbers on everything right now are, are based on what we know, right? Um, one of our um, primary objectives, once we um, do have control of the cloud with American Lease, is to figure out, like, how do we de-bloat this cloud? How do we how do we make it more streamlined and, like, not as expensive to operate, too? So. You know, there's a lot of stuff to to weed through, but you know, I think that the the thing that's exciting is that we have the opportunity to do it. Once again, you've been so generous with your insights today, and we've talked in the past uh, via email that mm -hmm. uh, you know, for me to hold your feet to the fire every once in a while, and yeah. I'm just I'm 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 really really grateful for that opportunity. So I'll I'll, I'll do it again soon when we know more. Thanks again, oh, yeah. Christian, uh, COO of the Fisker Owners Association. Make sure you join. Here's a link, Christian. Thanks again. Sure, anytime, Adam. Thank you.